Um, thank you all so much for having me here. It's it's an honor to be speaking with you all. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, I, I So that you know a little bit about me, I am a family doctor and I'm um, affiliated locally with Marshall Health and with the Marshall School of Medicine. So I'm part of the family medicine department and I teach residents and students. So I lecture a lot in that setting. I give lots of um, very, you know, information based like knowledge the students need to know knowledge the residents need to know very topic focused um, academic lectures uh, and I don't talk about podcasting much in those forums so it's really exciting to get to talk about this sort of other part of me this other thing that I do which is I do a medical history podcast uh, that my husband and I've been doing since 2013 now which is gosh it feels like a, it's a long time um, we started just because I liked medical history. And I will tell you that in medical school, they don't really teach you a ton of medical history. You'll get little anecdotes from professors who are interested in that. I'm sure there are some schools out there who offer that class. I did not. I had very little of that. And so I wondered, well, how did we get there? How did we come up with that, um, that you know, treatment or, or how we looked at that disease throughout history? And so researching it and reading about it was just something I was interested in. Um, and my husband is funny. He's a funny guy. And so we started doing this podcast where I tell him stories from medical history and he makes jokes. And that's the whole pitch. That's the whole, <laughs> that's the whole story. Um, and when I started doing it, uh, it, it was sort of a good fit for me for a couple of reasons. One, because I am a family doctor, I had this interest and I could give context on the medical end because of my expertise because of my my training and my education I could give that sort of medical context for things never advice I'm always very clear on that I'm not giving medical advice don't do that in a podcast um, but I do you know I provide context in that way but I think that there were a lot of things that throughout my life my career my education that sort of put me in a good position to do that and I think that's relevant to what I'm talking about now um, one I, I did used to want to be a writer. I always loved writing. I always loved um, talking. I used to think teaching might be part of my future because I love giving lectures and talking to people. Um, I was involved in theater from when I was a little kid. I did community theater um, most of my life. That's how my husband and I met. I liked uh, talking to people and being up in front of people. Um, and in my undergrad education, I was part of uh, what's called the Jaeger Scholars Program at Marshall. And the Jaeger Scholars Program forces you, which is a good thing, it's not a, it's not a bad thing, to uh, explore all these other arenas. You know, I knew I was going to be a biology major and have this chemistry minor, and that was the direction I was going. But because of the Jaeger Scholars Scholarship Program, I had to take these interdisciplinary seminars where I took classes in art and music and theater and history and I mean, everything. I had to take everything. I had to give speeches and write papers, and I had a speech mentor and a writing mentor, and I had to constantly be perfecting my communication skills. And I'm really glad and I'm really lucky I had all that exposure to all these different ideas and disciplines in undergrad because that that is how I ended up doing what I think is a successful medical history po uh, podcast now and why I think I'm, I'm good at communicating these scientific ideas, um, which it's one thing to do that in a lecture to people who are, you know, paying to go to medical school or they're in their residency training and they need this because their job depends on them understanding this information. It's a whole other thing to communicate scientific ideas and concepts to people when it's, it's for entertainment. You know, people don't listen to my podcast because it, it's been, you know, uh, a teacher has told them they have to. It hasn't been assigned to them, although that does happen. I do get emails that my, my podcasts are assigned to students occasionally, but uh, it's most people are engaging with it for their own entertainment and enjoyment. And so if I'm going to get something across to them and they're going to enjoy it, that's a that's a different level that I have to get to so that they will understand what I'm saying. They'll follow me on that journey. They'll take in that information and retain it. Um, it's, it's a whole other ball game, so to speak. So I wanted to talk about, and I'll go through a couple kind of areas of 
what I feel like I can do with this podcast. And I think any sort of scientific podcast could do the same thing. And I think, and you could do this in other formats, right? I don't do a lot of video, but certainly there are great science communicators who do this via YouTube. Um, you could do this in other, in other uh, media. Podcast is just the one that I have the most knowledge of. Um, so I want to go through what I can do with it and how I think I've accomplished that goal and how you can do it too, if, if it's something that you're interested in. Um, first of all, the most obvious thing that we do with the show is inform people. I always used to say when we started Sawbones that uh, my goal was that after you listen to some of my episodes, you'd be more likely to win a round of pub trivia. That was really, <laughs> that was the whole goal. You'll learn something from history that is maybe funny or interesting or weird and you'll retain it and you'll want to tell your friends about it at parties or or you'll like I said you'll answer a trivia question right and that'll be a cool fact that you know and that was really uh, my goal has shifted over time but that was my initial thing was this will be entertaining and you'll learn a little bit and that's fine and in order to teach people something especially if it's their free time again people are engaging with this in their free time for fun You've got to make it entertaining. Um, my husband does a lot of that heavy lifting because like I said, he's funny. Um, but the other reason that I think it works is because uh, Justin has no science background. He's not a physician. Um, he has a degree in theater. So he really is the audience in the room with me. Uh, he never knows what topic we're going to cover for the most part ahead of time. I might tell him the title, but I don't tell him any of the information especially the good bits, it, anything that I know he's going to find weird or gross or strange. I never tell him that stuff ahead of time. Um, and that does two things. One, it gets his reactions to be natural so that he can play off of what I'm saying in a way that I think the audience finds more entertaining. But the other benefit of that is he naturally will ask me questions to help him understand the information as they come up um, that the audience might have. And that is a really good perspective when you're entrenched in a scientific discipline. It is so easy to forget that everybody doesn't know what you know. And it's and the, the lines of where common knowledge and your expertise, where that line is, that gets so blurry, especially the further into your education, the further into your career you get, you take for granted that there's all this stuff that you know that everybody probably knows. And having Justin in the room with me to stop me and say, wait, what, what does that mean? Or when you say this, what do you mean? Or how, how would that work? Or I don't even understand what that diagnosis is. Can you wait, take a step back, break it down for me? That is the audience in the room of people who may also not have my knowledge and background saying, hey, wait, wait, I didn't understand what she just said. Justin does it for him. And so I think that's a really useful tactic in science communication to have somebody who is a lay person right there in the room with you to call call you out, so to speak, and ask questions as you go um, so that you can refine what you're saying and communicate more clearly and not take that for granted. Um, I think the other part of, of telling people something is to find a story. Um, that is why, and I want to talk about like the, the idea of dispelling misinformation a little more thoroughly, but I think that's why sometimes when people are telling stories about science that aren't true when they're when they're spreading misinformation you'll find that it's usually in the form of a of a story something that's provocative something that's emotional something that will um invite an emotional response from the listener uh that is because that works you remember that you react to that you retain that and you're more likely to change your thinking if it has generated that sort of response um, I try to do that on the information side. Um, when I'm researching a topic, I know from the beginning, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a completist because this isn't for a test. I'm not telling my audiences so that they can take a test on Sawbones later and pass a class. I'm telling it for fun. So I will read articles and chapters and tons of information about a topic before I decide what I want to say about it. And I might only talk about you know, a quarter of all the stuff I read, because I found that's where the hook is. That's where the story is. That's where the, the one, you know, in, in this entire history of how we treated this disease, there was this one decade where things got really wacky. And this is the thing people are going to want to know about, or this is the one person 
that people are going to want to hear about. And if I want to explore other aspects of that in other episodes later, I always have the freedom to do that. So I don't have to not tell the rest of the story ever. But you have to find a story in what you're trying to communicate in order to get people to react to that and connect with it and retain it. It can't just be like a survey. A lot of my early episodes, I, I made that mistake. I would just like, we talked about leeches and bloodletting, and I just kind of went through all of history. Here's every time that we did something like that, which is interesting, but that's not going to capture your imagination as much as a story. Um, one of my favorite episodes that we ever did was about, um, and this doesn't sound exciting at all. It was about how we figured out digestion. How does digestion work? And that sounds like a really boring thing, <laughs> like the history of digestion, but it was because the way that we figured that out was this weird lifelong relationship between these two figures, Alexis St. Martin, who was a fur trapper from Canada, and William Beaumont, who was a gastroenterologist. And Alexis St. Martin got shot in the stomach and developed a chronic gastric fistula. So he had a hole in his stomach that went directly into his stomach for his entire life. And William Beaumont, as a physician, first of all, saved his life, kept him from dying from this gunshot wound, and then proceeded to do experiments on this hole in his stomach for their entire lives. They would like meet up in hotel rooms and he would insert food tied to strings into his stomach hole and then pull it out to see what happened to it after an hour or two hours or three hours and what different meals, what would happen. And it's this weird relationship between these two unlikely friends doing these experiments throughout time and history. And when you tell this story to people to explain, and this is how we figured out digestion, you remember that. <laughs> um, if you just give people a series of, of enzymes that yeah, they might remember it, they might not. But if you find like, look at these people who did these things and isn't that interesting and weird and you give it that sort of humanity, people will remember that information a lot clearer. Um, and, and there's a lot of, uh, one of my other favorite ones is when we talk about the history of seasickness and how we used to treat seasickness through time um, before we had, you know, medications for the antihistamines and antiemetics and things. Uh, we, there was a guy who invented an entire saloon, like a separate compartment in a boat that was free floating on its own gimbals that would move independently of the movement of the boat on the ocean. And he called it the seasick proof saloon. And it's this fantastic story of this guy who invested tons of money into building this thing that was supposed to cure seasickness. Now, anyone can ride on a ship because they can sit in this free floating compartment inside and they'll never get seasick, except the movement of this compartment made the boat swing wildly when it was trying to dock. And he crashed it into the dock twice before he gave up on this idea um, which these are just, I mean, these stories of, of hubris and imagination. And I mean, it's, it's Icarus, but it's real. This is a real story that somebody really did um, to try to solve the problem of getting sick on a boat. So I think that finding those hooks and those stories when you're wanting to tell people a, a story about science, about history, about medicine, I think finding those stories are, are the first really important thing um, that I do. And I spend tons of time, I will say, when it comes to like, if I have a concept I need to explain, here's a scientific concept, here's a medical concept, here's how a certain drug works, like a mechanism of action, whatever. I will sit and think about, okay, I'm going to compare it. I'm going to use the metaphor of this. I'm going to compare it to this and this and this. And then I'll walk through it. And these are things that I'll tell Justin sometimes. I'll be like, if I told you this, this, and this, would you understand that metaphor? Would that, would that work for you? I spend a lot of time coming up with metaphors and analogies and like things that are relatable to explain scientific concepts so that when I do it, th that's the one of the few things I rehearse ahead of time. Those are never on the fly. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what is a corollary to how vaccines work that would make people understand how vaccines work without just, you know, what, what would that look like? What would that sound like? Um, so I think like that is something you can use your creativity and spend a lot of time on the front end doing. Um, I want to talk about dispelling misinformation too, as well as spreading information. But before I do that, are there any questions anybody has about that? I think there's 
I just so Anita has Anita. her hand oh. up. Would you like to ask your question? Sure. So I was thinking, um, you know, podcast is like a purely audio format, right? And at least in school, it's much easier when we have visuals to have something to tie it to. So I was wondering what the challenges are when you're trying to convey information without any visuals to accompany it. Uh, I think that that, so, so what you're asking is exactly why I spend so much time on the front end. Um, if there is a, a specific concept, if there's something like in order to understand the history of this disease, you need to understand this, the pathophysiology of something, that this is what's going wrong inside the human body that makes it happen. I spend so much time coming up with like a picture description of what that looks like, like a metaphor for what that is um, so that I can convey that. And I think that was the magic of being able to, once we had done this long enough, make it into a book is that I could include all those graphics and diagrams and my sibling Taylor actually did the illustrations for it and actually was able to illustrate some of those things that I'd sort of made up in my own head and told people um, to go along with it. But it is, I, I think that's the hardest thing is to, if you're gonna describe something that would be easier in a diagram, spend a lot of time thinking about how can I say this not in a science term? What would this be like in real life? What would be a metaphor for this? that people can immediately visualize because you can't visualize whatever, you know, whatever I'm talking about, the chemical reaction or whatever I'm talking about on the show. No, that's great. And it also makes sense like why people understand more science from your podcast because you make it relatable to real life. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Siddharth, if you have time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you you said that you spend so much time on you know researching the topic and then coming up with metaphors and things like that. Could you like go through like briefly like your I guess thought process and your research process and how you I guess come across the specific topic that you want to discuss and then how you find the specific information that you want to I guess mm -hmm. the background information and then how you want to construct the I guess, or build it up until you get to that topic that you want to discuss. Sure. I, uh, in the beginning, a lot of the topics were things that I had just wondered about, like in medical school, how in the world, or why did we ever, um, like maggots, we used maggots, then we decided not to use maggots for wound care. And now we sometimes use maggots again, because they actually do work pretty well at eating dead tissue in wounds. So like under certain circumstances, we're using that. What is the story of that? And so some of them were just my natural interest. Um, nowadays, a lot of my topics come from my listeners. Uh, I get lots and lots of emails, lots of suggestions. Um, so if it's not something that I've come across in my practice or because a student or a resident asked me, I'll just go to my email and check my, I never delete anything. I have a huge inbox. So I just go through and scan and I'll see, oh, I've never done that topic before. That would be really interesting. Um, in terms of like time, it depends on how sweeping the topic it is. If I'm pressed for time, if I have a really busy week, I know I can do a biography pretty quickly. Like if I want to do a figure for medical history, those are a little easier to put together. Um, if I have lots more time, I try to do concepts, like something like the, to talk about the the four humors and what that was in medicine and how what a huge impact that was on our medical understanding for so much of history you can't just do that in a few hours you know that'll that'll take me chunks out of several days and I might work on an episode like that or something where I, I feel like it's really important like when I was talking about I talked about COVID a lot during the pandemic and when I want to make sure that the information is accurate and helpful about something current I spend a lot more time and I might work on an episode for a couple of weeks and do something easier in between um, because we do publish every week. Um, I, one, I look for journal articles. There are tons of medical history journal articles out there. Um, so it's easy to find like peer reviewed information, primary sources, newspaper articles and stuff like that also. Um, and then I also have amassed a gigantic library now um, with books about medical history and older texts from largely from like the early 1900s about medical history like what what, what med it wasn't history it was what medicine was at the time um and so i those are my my primary sources i 
I think we can do, I think there's one more question and then I'll move on. Hi, um, I was wondering whenever you're conducting your research for your podcast, how do you deal with conflicting historical accounts or interpretations? And how do you convey that nuance without detracting from the story or overarching mes message of your episode? That is a really good question. That was something I learned um, as, I, as I went along. I knew enough about researching because I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I don't have like a background in learning how to research. I was, a, you know, a science undergrad and I went to medical school, but um, a lot of historical research, I was kind of figuring out for myself. I knew enough that if I was going to, if I was going to tell a story from history, I had to corroborate it. So I looked for multiple sources to make sure that I was telling something accurate. Um, but I have gotten a lot better at searching like for primary sources. I relied a lot more on pop sci, popular science articles and stuff in the beginning. And I don't trust those as much. They're kind of a nice jumping off point. It's like a Wikipedia article. It's okay to scan a Wikipedia article to give you a broad overview. I would never use that as a reference. I might use that to look for references. I might see what's cited in there and then go chase down those as some leads and then chase down where did they find that information. Um, but I think, I think that was the big thing is to get as close to where did that come from as possible. And then when I can't, uh, I just did an episode that I actually haven't, we haven't even published yet on the history of hand sanitizer and which I know sounds really dry, but it's actually kind of cool. But uh, I, the story of where hand sanitizer came from is almost certainly false, almost certainly false. But I can't, and I, I read a historian from the Smithsonian who's tried to track this down too, which was very helpful. Um, so I just have to say that I'm really good about recognizing now, you know what, I, I can't tell you this piece of the history for sure. Nobody knows this piece. And so I will tell you there's some grayness there. I can tell you all this information that actually we know is true and is verified and validated and interesting, but here's this piece that I'm not able to corroborate right now. So I've gotten, a, I've, I've become a better researcher over time doing this. Thank you. Um, oh, no problem. Uh, the other part of it, well, a couple other parts, but the other big thing that I learned I could do with the show over time was to dispel misinformation. Um, I did not consider that part of the goal of Sawbones when we started. I really, it was supposed to just be for fun. And so the idea that I would use it to combat something was not, um, on my radar. I think a couple things happened. One, as our audience grew and I was aware of, and I think uh, vaccines are a good, like sort of, that's a good jumping off point to talk about where misinformation around something can really do damage. Um, as I realized that I had this platform, I started to feel a responsibility, not just to entertain people and give them some interesting information, but also to help them with what I understand, with my knowledge base, help them make good decisions about their health and safety. Um, I, I felt like I had that sort of obligation once I had a big enough platform to do so. Um, and then I think the other thing that was really interesting is we did an episode that I didn't think was controversial when I did it on the history of fluoride and putting fluoride in drinking water. And I did not expect the um, number of angry emails. And I had no idea how many people are adamantly against, passionately against fluoride. Um, and as I read through these responses and my initial thought was, did I miss something? <laughs> Have I had the wrong idea about fluoride my whole life? And so I started reading and I realized like, oh my gosh, there's a ton of, wow, of conspiracy theories about fluoride that don't seem to be grounded in anything and really are spreading a lot of misinformation and, and it totally caught me off guard. Um, and then I thought, you know, if I'm going to take care of people as a physician, if I'm going to be a voice for science communication, I, I better get my act together. I better be aware of that kind of thing. And, you know, I should use that, my voice, my ability to, to talk to people to help push back against some of that misinformation. Um, and the, and the biggest area that we've done that is in vaccines, um, helping people understand how they work and what they can't do, like cause autism, 
um, where those ideas came from. I think that's another big thing. A lot of people, you know, if you just say, no, vaccines don't do that and move on, they're going to ask a very natural human question, which is, but why do people think they do? I mean, where did that come from? Like, is it made up from whole cloth or who said it or where is it? So I think I can do that with the show. I can tell you, here's where that idea came from. It isn't right. It's false. But let me explain to you how it got adopted and accepted and who said what that was wrong and who misunderstood what. And let me help break that down for you. And I really think that that one helps people feel more comfortable with something like vaccines that, that you know, most people aren't anti-vax. They're either fine with them or they're just hesitant. And you can reach all those hesitant people if you just explain things and answer their questions. Um, so I think it really helps people do that. And it arms people with information. When they hear this stuff out in the world, then they can say, oh, well, actually, no, I can tell you where that idea came from. Um, I heard it on a podcast and let me tell you why it's wrong. And let me tell you where it actually, you know, what the, what the truth about it is. Um, I realized that, that you could do that really effectively. Um, and again, a lot of the way we do that, when I, uh, one of the stories about vaccines that I really love, I love talking about Maurice Hilleman, who was a doctor who um, invented the majority of childhood vaccines that I and probably all of you have had. Um, and when you talk about the story of Dr. Hilleman, one of the most compelling is when he came up with the mumps vaccine. He made the mumps vaccine after his daughter, Gerald Lynn, got mumps and he swabbed her throat. And that's that was the virus that initially that he used to culture those cells, like culture the virus from those cells to create the first mumps vaccine. And there's this amazing picture of him sitting there giving his other daughter a mumps vaccine made using the strain of mumps that her older sister had. And when you talk about that and, you know, look at what this, I mean, in my mind, hero of, of medicine and science did and look at the risks he took and look how personal it was for him um, to create this thing that would protect his other child from having mumps like her older sister did. And when you can kind of tell those stories, these are the people behind it. And these are the, the actual people who benefited from it. Um, when you talk about the story of the, the polio vaccine, and I always... I always try not to get choked up when I talk about the polio vaccine. Uh, but when, you know, Salk made the polio vaccine and they asked him if he would patent it because he could have made a lot of money, he said, can you patent the sun? Which is an amazing, you know, no, of course he's not going to patent it because everybody needed it. And when they first released it, um, parents were so desperate for a vaccine. They lined up outside to let their children get this experimental vaccine um, way more than they needed for the early trials. Parents were desperate to get, and, and just the idea of that, the, the trust in science and the, the, you know, desperation of people and that, I mean, it's just these stories about vaccines, when you start to look at them in that light, I think it's a lot easier to get people on the side of these are amazing, you know, innovations that we have come up with as humans and that we continue to innovate and perfect and save lives with, um, and I think that those sort of stories are, are, they're really powerful to fight back against the stories. When you hear like anti-vaccine store, anti-vaccine um, groups talk about why they don't, they always have the same kind of, they have stories, they have people, they put a face to it, they make it emotional. Um, and I don't mean that the, everyone's ill-intentioned. Some people honestly believe what they're saying, even if they are wrong. Um, but I think that on the, on our end, part of my job as a family doctor is to promote vaccines, is to promote preventive medicine. And I need to be better about communicating it on that same level and making it human and making it real, um, and finding that kind of connection. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of it is just finding that human story, um, and um, taking people through the story of it. And I think that was the, that's the other thing I was gonna say about the podcast is a good medium for this. There are lots of mediums you could use to dispel misinformation. And again, video does this very well too. I think the nice thing about a podcast is it's very intimate. Um, when you listen to a podcast, a lot of people will, like my husband and I, when we listen to podcasts, it's often each of us have an earbud in and we're listening to a podcast together. 
Um, and I feel, you know, connected to what I'm listening to, to the story, to the medium. Um, and that really gives you a chance to connect with your audience and feel close to them and develop a trust with them. As long as you're being honest and well-researched and well-intentioned, you can do that with an audio medium, um, which is something I don't think you can as easily make that sort of intimate connection uh, with video. So I, I do think that that is kind of one advantage of this is I'm that little voice in your ear. Um, people will write me emails and say they fall asleep to my podcast, which I think is a compliment. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that trust is never something to take for granted. If you have built that trust with people, you always have to deliver on it. You always have to make sure you're holding yourself to the highest standard of truthfulness and um, make sure you get it right. And if you ever get it wrong, which I have, occasionally I've gotten stuff wrong. I really thought I had something right. And then usually a listener will send me an email and say, hey, actually you said this and I know why you thought that, but, and I'm quick to, in those instances, correct myself and get the word out there. I got that wrong. <laughs> I'll do better next time. Um, so that, that, you know, my listeners can trust me that I'm, I'm getting it right. Um, and this is really when it comes to misinformation, I always say like giving people that sort of context that's the other thing, giving people a historical context for where things come from. It is so much easier for me to convince people that what they read, I don't know if you're familiar with Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow's lifestyle website, magazine thing, whole thing. Um, there are a lot of ideas, products, articles that are not accurate, that are pseudoscientific that are being pushed and not just on that. I always take aim at that because it's an easy repository for a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, but a lot of that sort of wellness culture, you'll find a lot of pseudoscience and misinformation within there. Um, my listeners know that people who sell snake oil have been kind of doing the same thing for a very long time because I've done episodes on it. And the tricks that you use to sell people patent medicine um, that just was full of you know opium and alcohol and cocaine back in the 1800s, they're the same tricks that people are using today. Um, and so I think giving people that sort of like wide angle lens on history, some things never change. People are always looking for quick fixes. People are always looking for cure-alls. There are always going to be, unfortunately, people out there who will take advantage of fear, of misunderstanding, of desperation to try to sell you something. Um, I think that once you sort of step back and look at the scope of medical history, it's a lot easier to say, this is another example of that today. This is why this is not something that, that you should be doing. Um, and before I get into sort of the last thing that I think I can do with my show, are there any questions about, about that aspect of it? If not... I will. Okay. I don't think so. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, i I feel like the other thing that I can do with that you can do with this sort of science communication that is entertaining, but also seeks to inform people or, or help them reach better understanding, um, is to sort of what I think of, like, I think of as show, show them how the sausage is made. Um, I think that this has become very relevant through the pandemic. Uh, a lot of the early episodes we did at the very beginning of 2020 um, with lockdowns and, and, and everything, I did episodes talking about the history of that. I did episodes talking about, uh, a lot of it I compared to the uh, influenza pandemic of 1918, what was colloquially called the Spanish flu, which is actually a misnomer, but. Um, that is probably how you've heard it referred. Uh, that talking about during that pandemic, there were lockdowns and people furious about them. There were anti-maskers. There was a whole anti-mask society formed because people began to promote, you know, wearing a mask is maybe a useful way to stop you from spreading influenza. And there were people who stood up in city council meetings demanding that they all be able to take their masks off and, and saying that it was government control and that it would make you sicker to wear a mask and that it would harm your health to wear a mask. All of the things that we heard during the pandemic about masking, 
all of those things, people were saying those a hundred years ago. Um, and I think that when we were in this like quickly evolving situation like COVID was, where our understanding of the virus, of how we could protect ourselves, how it was spread, um, how we could best support people, treat people, vaccinate people, as we were watching that evolve to see that we've done that before. We've been here before. None of this is new. And it always takes this long to work through things. And it always takes us a while to come up with, you know, it, it's easy to look back on history and say, well, here's what we should have been doing. When you're in the midst of a situation, science doesn't tell you the answer right away. And in fact, sometimes you get the wrong answer. Sometimes it leads you in a direction that makes sense. And then after you test it, you say, well, no, that actually didn't work. Um, and so I think that showing people instances throughout history where it really took us that long and it really was that hard to figure something out helps people understand when there is sort of um, a lack of answers on a scientific topic today. Because that's really frustrating when you can't give people the exact answer. I don't know the truth right now. And there are a lot of people out there who are willing to tell them, well, I do know the truth and it's this, and they're probably wrong. Um, but I think some great examples of that are, uh, I always love this one, with cholera, uh, it took us a really long time to understand how cholera was spread. And part of this was because we were still kind of grappling with the germ theory of disease and the, the very idea of something being contagious was not well understood. But one of the ways that we finally understood, uh, and, and the, big, the big thought process prior to this was this sort of like, it, was, it had to do with how hygienic you were. And if you were a dirty person, if you lived in poverty, um, if you lived in certain areas of town, then you're more likely to get cholera. Whereas wealthy people who are clean and well-to-do would never get cholera. It's a dirty person's disease. And that was very much this sort of thought process as if, as if, chol as if cholera could like pick and choose which you know social strata it wanted to infect and um, made some sort of moral judgment on who got sick and who didn't. And of course there were people who knew better, who had the idea there is something we can't see that is infecting people that we're spreading from person, you know, we don't understand how, but we know that this is happening. And the way that that was finally proven, there was a scientist, Max von Petter Petterkoffer, and the way that uh, he showed that cholera was actually something that some sort of microscopic organism that people were ingesting, and we didn't know exactly what it was, but this is how it was being passed, is he actually got a sample of stool. This is going exactly where you think you're, it's going. It's really this gross. He got a sample of stool from somebody who had cholera, and he blended it up, and he ingested it. Yeah, I know and he got cholera. <laughs> and it was his way of proving once and for all, this, is, this, is, this has nothing to do with me and how, what a good person I am or how often I wash, you know, I wash my clothes or how much money I make or, or how well regarded I am in society. This is just, if you come in contact <laughs> with diarrhea from somebody who's had cholera, you're gonna get cholera. And that, that's true for anybody. Um, and I think that when you tell a story like that, that is what it took for, you know, people to finally say, oh, I think maybe that that might be right. <laughs> I guess if you're willing to go that far, I think that's true. It's similar if we think about the history of hand washing, you know, Simmelweis, the doctor who came up with the idea, the radical idea that we should wash our hands. That was really it. And the first time that he suggested that, I mean, he was completely rejected from every medical society. I mean, he, he died in poverty. He was, com he, all of his peers thought he was this complete, you know, not sane person for suggesting, I think we are making people sick when we go from dissecting cadavers directly to delivering babies and we don't wash our hands and our coats are coated in like blood and gore. I think something in that process is making people sick. And I think if we wash our hands in between, we won't make people sick. And the, I mean, it took it took a hundred more years for people to go, I think he was right. <laughs>
I think washing his, I think washing your hands is actually something we should do. And I think he was onto something, but I, I, again, I think that sort of taking that wide angle lens, showing people that it really can take that long. You really do have to go to these great lengths. We did a whole series on self-experimentation, um, all the different doctors and scientists throughout medical history who, in order to finally get their point across and make their voice heard, you know, tested something on their themselves, did a, had a, had a cardiac catheterization done on themselves first, or, you know, in, intentionally infected themselves um, with syphilis and gonorrhea. <laughs> I mean, all of these stories exist because these are the links that we have to go to sometimes in science to move forward, to sort of shift uh, this, you know, the heaviness of what current thought is onto what it could be. Um, and I think the other way that I, I do that, I think that you show people how that happens. You give them a human story. And I always try to be humble in how I present that information. I try to be relatable. Um, I try to use examples that I think will speak to most people. Um, it's why I, I, I always think that like taking all those other classes in undergrad and having all these other interests. I always, uh, I have a lot of peers in medicine, a lot of my friends who literally all they read are medical journals. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's all you want to do is read medical journals, please do go for it. That is totally fine. But I do think that if you want to go into science communication, if you want to talk to people about, for me, a lot of it's medicine, um, being able to cite, I don't know, popular television shows or songs or cartoons from my youth, I think using those sort of touchstones when I'm trying to get a point across really helps people to understand stuff. Um, and it makes people feel like this is not, uh, you know, I am not a scientist that um, I'm somebody they could talk to. I get emails like that, that, you know, people feel like I'm, yeah, you're somebody I could ask a question. You're somebody that I would feel comfortable um, and I feel empowered to ask that question. And I hope that they carry that into their lives with like their doctors. I always say that, like, ask your doctor that question. I love when patients ask me questions and I get to like explain something I know. Um, and I think a lot of people feel intimidated by their doctors, like they can't do that. They're just supposed to like listen and do the right thing and leave. And it's an anxiety provoking experience. So I think like empowering people to ask questions is good. Um, and again, the last thing I'll say, I think that having the ability to do this, I think that all of you, especially it is so much easier for younger people <laughs> to harness the power of video and podcasting. And I mean, all of these things that I, you know, I'm, I was born in 1983 <laughs> when I graduated from high school, I would never have said, I want to be a podcaster. There wasn't podcasting. Um, it didn't exist. And so, you know, there, there was this kind of barrier, which my husband helped me cross a lot of it because he's much more tech savvy than me to getting into this medium and really being able to use it well, that I don't think exists for younger people who have grown up with this technology. Um, and I really think you can do amazing things with these sort of unusual formats, whether it's, uh, I mean, there are some amazing tweet threads that have taught me things and sent me in directions. I did a great episode about the history of um, the Black Panthers and the free medical clinics they established and how um, that's something you never hear about. But the Black Panthers were instrumental in providing this sort of like culture of free medicine and free clinics and the idea that medicine should, healthcare was a right. Um, that's a story that I learned about on Twitter I went and researched and was able to do a podcast about and share that information with more people about. Um, and I, I really think that, uh, that kind of utilizing these techniques and keeping these things in mind, you all, you all can do the same. So any other questions I can answer? <laughs>